All the monsters I feared as a child, I believed were under my bed. As an adult, the truth is more horrifying, because the monsters live in my head. A poem by Alicia N. Green. We've got a hell of a show for you. It's going to be a howling good time right here on the best in paranormal talk and radio. I'm Dave Schrader. This is my Paranormal 60. I'm not going to stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural. Perhaps. Baloney. Perhaps not. Hello, my little darklings, and welcome to my little corner of the dark street in every town, in every village. Tonight, we're going to be talking about monsters. We'll be talking about the dog man of Texas. And then later on, we're going to also talk about a myriad of different strange, nocturnal, bizarre creatures. That's tonight on the show. But before we begin, I want to acknowledge something. One of my absolute favorite things is traveling and getting to go all over the United States to meet amazing people. And filming the TV shows, The Holes Are Files, and then Ghosts of Devil's Perch, I have certainly had my chance to meet many different amazing people. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite people ever is in Butte, Montana. Her name is Chevy. And tonight I want to introduce you to my friend Chevy because she is amazing and gives the best hugs on the planet. But right now, Chevy's a little sad. Her dad has been sick and is going through quite a lot. So I'm asking each and every one of you darklings across the world to say a little prayer for Jason to John, to keep him in your thoughts and prayer, send him healing energy, sending him positivity, sending him love and light and strength for body, mind, and spirit. And I want you guys to engulf this little girl, Chevy, in all the love that you can spare and send it to her so she continue to be strong and smart and help her dad. She's been such a good helper. That's what Jason told me. And she just needs a little bit more strength, a little bit more love coming from you, the outside world. So please consider doing that for me and for Jason and for Chevy, because sending out that energy and that love does make a difference. Sending out prayers does make a difference. And they do need that. So Chevy, Jason, you're in my thoughts and prayers, and I know that good things are coming. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Let's get started with tonight's show. I got to tell you, growing up, one of my favorite monsters of all time, werewolves. I don't know what it is about them. The whole lycanthropy, the whole, it doesn't look pleasant. It looks like one of the most painful transformations on the planet, but there's something better about werewolves for me than there are with vampires or mummies or water creatures. But we're all safe, right? Because that's just legend and lore. It's movie folklore at best. Or is it? Is there something more to these stories? Well, if you live in Texas, you might be familiar with some of these stories. As a matter of fact, our friend and author is going to join us in just a moment. Aaron Deese, the Texas Dogman Triangle, is here to talk to us about this. He has done the research. He has spoken to the eyewitnesses, and he's going to shed a little light on the subject tonight. Nikki Folsom joins us a little bit later. That's right. Chachi's wife is here and in control. She'll be telling us some even creepier stories of strange beings, ones I don't want to run into in the dark. But first, let's start with a guy I wouldn't mind running into in the dark. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Deese. Hey, Aaron. Welcome to the show. Hey, Dave. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing well. You know, when I get... Uh, somebody from a publicist sends me out literature about werewolves, dogmen, any of these kind of skinwalkers. I'm psyched, man. You've got me hook, line, and sinker. I need to know more. I want to know more. Let's start off with a very basic question, okay? Werewolves, skinwalkers, mm-hmm. uh, lycanthropes, dogmen. 
it's almost seemed like these dogmen are in a totally different category unto themselves for the longest time. As a matter of fact, when I started talking about these creatures, people that were researching it seemed to stay away from the folklorian version. Is that a word, folklorian? If not, I'm trademarking it. It's mine. It may as well be. It is yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> well, why is it that there's a separation? And, and in your opinion, is there a difference between the dogmen and werewolves? So that's a great question because it depends on who you ask. Are we talking about unclassified animals, cryptids, you know, Bigfoot like creatures that resemble canines, or are we talking about things that are more spiritual in nature that, that perhaps come from, you know, some origin dealing with dark magic or spectral forces. Problem is that we don't know. Um, in Texas, what we tend to see seem to be more of the typical cryptozoological type sightings. Like these are often mistaken for Bigfoot, but what you have are the pointed ears and the glowing eyes and some other characteristics that define them that I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll get into. So when you say werewolf, are we talking about a shapeshifter or are we talking about an upright walking dog? So it, it in my mind, it depends who you ask. At least that's been my experience. All right. When, you look into Native American tradition, indigenous peoples, there is legend and folklore, and and many of them say that there is a reality when it comes to Bigfoot, that it is just another tribe that they respect and they allow to keep their distance. At least that's most of the tribes that I've spoken with. Is there that same consideration and reverence for the dog man, or is it from the Native American culture, these skinwalkers, shapeshifters, that there seem to be so many different legends surrounding. Another great question. And I'm, I'm hesitant to comment on... Woo, two for yeah. two. Hot yeah, damn. I'm, I'm, I'm on have a you, roll. Have you done this before? Uh, <laughs> when you're talking to folks of Native American descent, and I was able to speak to a, a few, you know, a few folks during, during the writing of this book, there's an acknowledgement that these things exist, that they've been there mm -hmm. for a very, very long time. Um, but the folks that I spoke to, again, the shape-shifting dark magic element didn't really seem to come up. It's the, the idea that these things are out there. They are dangerous. They're not friendly to you. Stay away from them. Leave them alone. And that seems to come up again and again when you talk to people that live with these things on a regular basis, whether they're, you know, out in the big thicket, Sam Houston National Forest area, whether they're down in Medina Lake, you know, closer to San Antonio, a uh, gentleman up in the Dallas Fort Worth area, I spoke with quite a bit, the same approach. I know they're out there. I just stay away from them. I don't want to mess with them. So whether that spiritual and religious and traditional reverence is there, that, from my understanding, varies from tribe to tribe. In the cases that I examine and the witnesses I talk to, the idea is just stay away from these things. So is there talk of them being like an earth elemental? Um, I've, I've been told from some of the different indigenous tribes that I've spoken to they don't get very deep into giving out much information, but mm -hmm. they've said, because one thing I've always questioned is why, if the settlements, if the, the, you know, mounds are messed with, why are your spirits and ancestors still haunting these areas? Why don't they move on to the happy hunting ground? Why don't they go to the next level? And, and I've been told by a lot of these different groups, well, they do, but the thing that's protective is not the ancestor spirits, but it's mm -hmm. these elementals, these earth elementals. Um, is there a tie in you think with what a dog man might be that it's, it's more of an earth creature that takes on this scary vestige to try to scare people off from disrespecting areas or put mm -hmm. the fear of God in those that have. I think there's definitely something to be said there. At least it's at least worth considering because you do see that response in these witnesses over and over and over again. People are terrified of these things. They're not they're not happy about having seen them. They don't go home like, "Well, that was great. That was cool. I saw a weird light in the sky <laughs> or I saw what could have been big." Right. Things. These are not positive encounters for these people. So, if there is some spiritual spectral element to it, I definitely think that has to come into play somewhere. And I've had the question asked like, "Well, how many of these sightings cross over into native burial grounds?" And the fact is we don't know. 
Um, Texas is huge. It's enormous. There is so much history here that goes back so, so far. And we have so many indigenous tribes and, and folks that have settled from other places and other parts of the world. We don't know where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> we do know that a lot of people <laughs> right. have died here. Yeah. So to mm -hmm. cross-reference these sightings with, um, you know, native burial grounds, which is something that's been suggested to me is, is something that currently I don't have the logistical capacity to to do <laughs> now aaron you're gonna have to stop freaking people out for those people listening every time you put your hands down on the desk it makes this boom, boom oh sound. i'm sorry i'm sorry so people, <laughs> people are, are listening and suddenly going to turn their head thinking something's banging on the side of their yeah, house or cabin. there could be one outside right now pardon me so sorry about that <laughs> being out there researching these cases do you ever inject yourself into the locations to see if you could have an experience I have not done that. I've been to several locations um, just around the hill country, places that I already mm -hmm. kind of live close to. They were easy to get to, but I have not gone out and done a proper field investigation, if you like. Um, I would like to. Is, is, that <laughs> out of, is that out of fear or respect or a little bit of both? Oh, definitely both. Absolutely both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I use the excuse that I have a baby and don't have time to do anything, but I'm terrified, man. Like, I, I, yeah. I don't know if I necessarily want to meet one of these things. And I've also reached a point where I feel like if I did have a sighting and I told anybody about it, it would be, oh yeah, of course you saw one. You're the, the werewolf guy. Of course you saw one. But to answer your question, I, I would like to try. I would like to make an attempt. I feel like I need to, you know? You'd love to see one from about four feet behind uh, three foot thick glass, right? That, yes. that would be about the safest place to absolutely. One. I'd like to be armed. I'd also like to have, you know, maybe <laughs> some some ecclesiastical icons, some iron shavings, some salt, just a little variety of things. A little bit of everything, just in case. <laughs> just <Yeah>. in case. <laughs> A strawberry shortcake doll, whatever works in that sure. situation. Yeah. We don't know what these guys want. No. Yeah, I'll just toss no. it all out there. Here you go, buddy. That's right. <laughs> How far back do these stories really go? I mean, obviously, the 30s, we had the Wolfman movies with Lon Chaney. And I know that going back in history in Europe, there are some very strange stories of Wolfman-like creatures. As a matter of fact, an entire town was being stalked by one. When they ended up shooting this thing, they ended up finding the town pastor, which I have to guess is what inspired the movie Silver Bullet that Stephen King wrote, right? The book and and and, and movie. But um, are there deep roots in our American history towards these beings as well? So the stories in Texas go back at least to the late 1800s, um, possibly mm -hmm. further. We don't have a lot of primary sources or records from those times. What we have is an oral tradition that's kind of been passed around through the hill country. And we see these stories popping up online. People like Michael Mays, Lyle Blackburn, Ken Gerhard have been incredibly diligent in writing these down and recording them. So mm -hmm. part of my role was to kind of gather them from these different sources and talk to the people that wrote them down and bring in as many details as possible. But we do see this oral tradition going back to the late 1800s. Um, we have the Converse Werewolf. We have the Beast of Bear Creek. We have the Bear King of Marble Falls. Um, and those are just three examples of folk tales about upright canines or canine-like creatures in Texas that when you look at them all together, they start to form kind of a pattern. At least in the way these things are described. So yes, yes is the short answer. I, the reason I ask and wondering how far back they went, you said maybe around the 1800s. It just was interesting to me that so much European folklore seemed to follow the settlers. I wonder when it comes to creatures like Sasquatch and the Dogman, how many stories predate the settlers, predate mm -hmm the people coming here and taking over these properties and bringing their belief systems, bringing their tulpas and thought forms and fears into this land. Do you, in speaking to indigenous members, have they ever talked about it going back, you know, into the 1600s, 1500s, 1200s? Not in my experience. Um, okay. Again, you have you have this acknowledgement from folks of indigenous descent that, yes, these things have been here for a very long time. But specific cases that we can trace seem to go back as far as the 1800s. And you mentioned people bringing their beliefs with them and their own thought forms. We have a lot of German and French settlers, uh, settlers rather, in, in Texas or did at the time that these things were popping up. Um, the town of Converse was originally a German settlement. So 
these beliefs are ingrained into the societies where people are seeing these things, whether they're coming from an indigenous native background or from a European settlers background, we're not necessarily sure because they seem to cross over and intermix, you know, they do have things in common. So it's, it's, it's hard to trace. Well, you, you brought up three different cases that date back out of the three. Tell us about one of the creepiest, weirdest of the, uh, examples for sure the the converse werewolf is the one that i really think sets the tone for the book because you have details that have been repeated over and over and over again you have this upright walking canine creature and in this particular story you have an anecdote about a young man actually being killed by one of these things hmm. um, the story goes that his father sent him out to a local area known as skulls crossing where you can still visit today there's a skulls crossing ranch you can look it up on google and uh he was he came back after a time he was terrified he said i'm not going out there there's a monster um of course his dad said no get get out of here go do you know go out there go hunting you're, you're in texas we do that here um young man didn't come back the dad gathered some local neighbors they went out into the woods and they found his son being fed upon by this creature and the problem is we don't have newspapers we don't have uh primary witness statements we don't have this in a book anywhere uh other than not even on myspace not that I could find. Now, you know, no, MySpace oh. profiles, they're still up there. They're still active, but they seem to be, like, seem to be shell profiles. There's no real content. <laughs> and when I say it's not in a book, this, has, this story has been written down in other books before, but we mm. really dug in deep on the details with this one because I wanted as much of this to come into focus as possible because it, it really emphasizes, look, if these things are out there, they are dangerous. They pose a threat to us. And there are a lot of people that will tell you that they are out there. Right now we're seeing science prove that there are gigantic forms of animals from our past, right? Mm -hmm. There are these monstrous deals that were just wolves, but they were giant. And I don't, you can really get respect for a timber wolf when you see a full blown in the nature timber wolf They're They can they're, be massive for enormous, right? Right. So you've got that. And I've got to guess when the, you know, their territory is not being in, infringed upon, they might have even been bigger at one point, right? Uh, have we found bones that you're aware of, of these kind of beings that would show much larger capabilities? Not that we can necessarily point to implicitly and say, this is, sorry, I touched the desk again. This is probably a dog man skeleton. Don't, we don't have any of those. But to play devil's advocate, how would we know? You know, if we find some canine bones or canine remains out in the hill country, oh, well, that's a coyote. That's a dog decomposition happens very quickly of course mm -hmm. and we have a lot of scavengers out here we have coyotes everywhere so the propensity for these bodies you know theoretical bodies to be broken down and destroyed very very quickly is definitely there on that same token we do have precedent in texas for weird canine hybrids and mixtures giving us results of things that we're not supposed to necessarily see in nature um the texas terror dog or the artist formerly known as the chupacabra <laughs> the texas chupacabra, <laughs> right <laughs> is a great is a great example um we have what i affectionately refer to as the galveston wolves which are uh these you know breeds that were documented a few years ago that have mixes of mexican red wolf dna so does the Texas terror dog. We're not supposed to have wolves in Texas. They were extirpated back in the mid 1900s. So we do know that there are canines out in the, the hidden places in Texas coming up with different combinations of DNA, surprising us and subverting our expectations. If you cross reference that with all these reports of upright walking canines, that's where I start to see this pattern emerge. Yeah. Now with the converse creature, the, the converse werewolf, how did that story finally end? It ended with, and again, it's oral history, but the mm -hmm. most versions seem to end with the farmer just kind of returning to his land, uh, possibly not living very long after that, whether he, you know, took his own life or drank himself to death or just gave up. We don't really know, but it, it basically just ends with this guy kind of losing everything. You know, mm. brutal. Were there more slayings that they, attribute to this beast not that i not that we can trace no and again if if there are sources for it out there somewhere there may be additional anecdotes but as far as we know the converse werewolf you know harmed this one person and then seems to have disappeared interesting all right now bring us into more contemporary times if we start looking into people that are maybe not as religion-based fear mongers you know fear-based people uh, start bringing into the 40s and 50s. Uh, do we see any sightings of these strange creatures going back 
to that point? We do. There are some very interesting ones. We have uh, kind of going a little bit later in the 60s and 70s is when we see a higher concentration. But even as far back as the 50s, we have a, a one called the Gregton Werewolf. And this was a story that was originally out of Fate magazine. And prior to its inclusion in this book, which Heather Mosier was able to secure rights for, which I'm super excited about, you couldn't read that article anywhere. You couldn't find it online. It wasn't in any books. I had to track down an old issue of Fate magazine just to prove that it existed. But yeah. you have this story of this upright walking wolf, you know, standing by this lady's window at night when she's trying to fall asleep. And I did some research. Heather did some research. The town is still there. We were able to trace some people who we thought might be Heather was really able to trace some people we thought might be modern descendants of the original witness. But that unfortunately didn't pan out. But the story describes her as seeing this thing standing outside her window at the start of a thunderstorm. It really plays out like a horror movie. And she you know, freaked out, shined a flashlight on it, saw it run off into the bushes. And then she said when it reemerged, it was a person and not an upright wolf. So again, we do see some stories that fall into this kind of horror movie type vibe. And I probably because I'm just so excited, I can't remember the exact year that the story comes from, but the decade in which it was reported, something like 30 werewolf centric movies were released between the U S and Mexico. So these mm. are ideas that were interesting, right? These are ideas that were right. on people's minds. This was post Lon Chaney Wolfman, but I, again, devil's advocate. Well, if you had just seen Lon Chaney's Wolfman and you saw a dog, man, you would probably think they were the same thing. So, right. You know. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So coming into more modern times, are we still seeing this or have we, is the evolution of consciousness in the brain stepped beyond being, you know, seeing wolf-like beings walking amongst us? Or is the dog man alive and well in the borders of Texas? He is alive and well. And that's actually what started this for me initially was speaking to somebody I knew personally who had had their own sighting. And I had heard of the Beast of Bray Road. I had heard of the Michigan dog man. And hearing him describe his roadside encounter with one of these things, it, it was almost point for point what you read about in some of these more infamous stories. So this was in 2018 and then mm -hmm. tracing it through, uh, I looked at the North American Dogman research project. They had a sighting about 50 miles from where this one occurred in 2016. And then another one, another 50 miles away in 2020. So these things are still happening. And then mo in fact, most of the witnesses I talked to for the book were more modern encounters, people that saw them themselves and said, yeah, I I've looked at these things and they're terrifying. So if anything, sightings seem to be increasing and we have to ask, okay, well, were we just not paying attention before? Are these again, tulpas or thought forms that now that the werewolf is more in the zeitgeist, we're manifesting more often. Are we just finally reaching a point in the study of the paranormal where we can say, this looks more like a Bigfoot sighting. This looks like something else that I don't know, but they do seem to be increasing with frequency. Now, are we seeing, uh, differing views of them like the bigfoot encounter i had i always joke around he had this kind of black gray mane i always said he looked like barry gibb to me but with a dark inset face right mm. uh he had that big hair and then the hair came up over the back of his hands when he pushed the bush down to look at me um are, are you seeing different colors are they always that kind of dark brown or gray they generally seem to be that dark brown, gray, black. Sometimes mm -hmm. we hear described speaking with someone, a gentleman by the name of Tex Wesson has a, I believe his podcast is Texas back porch. Really great guy. Definitely check it out. Mm -hmm. um, he spoke about a sighting of a white one, an actual upright walking white canine. And that was the first time I had heard that. I believe he said that was down near Lytle, Texas. And I could be mistaken. Um, he didn't have all the details, so it didn't make it onto the, the map proper, but we have heard stories about white ones and that's whole nother can of beans. <laughs> Are they genetic right. aberrations from the line of genetic aberrations? What is that? I, I wish I knew. See, I would love to speak again to the indigenous tribe members, right? The white Buffalo and other white iterations of animals mean different things to them mm -hmm. uh, from good luck to bad luck and anything in between it, these white wolves. I wonder what that comes with, agree. what kind of history. I would agree. And I'll be, I'll be the first to, to acknowledge that my knowledge of native folklore and, and native traditions is not, not strong. So I, I 
again, I'm very hesitant to comment and say, yeah, I think that's what that is. I think more research is needed. I think more, more people need to be interviewed, but again, you have, you have mm -hmm. possibly the bias against speaking about these things. And then you also have the hesitancy on people's part to report their encounters. So you have multiple obstacles in trying to, trying to dig that apart. Aaron Deese is our guest, The Texas Dogman Triangle. We have a link for that book on today's program guide, so make sure you go pre-order that uh, so that you can get a copy for yourself. And then once you've you purchased it, make sure you rate and review these books as well. It does go a long way to help our guests and the author so that the book gets more and more exposure. It does. Uh, do we have any eyewitnesses that have actually physically encountered, left with a scratch, left with a bite mark, left with anything that would give us pause more than just seeing a fleeting creature run across the street or into the woods. We do not quite to the level you're describing, but there is a gentleman who goes by John in the Dallas Fort Worth. And I, I, I speak about him often because I think it's a really important case, but he has reported encounters with these things since November of two years ago. And he's said that on multiple occasions, they've charged him down. They've, they've stood up and tried to intimidate him. He, he, none of them have ever actually managed to make physical contact with him. But he says when he shoots them, they don't die. He told me about a particular encounter, which is in the book, where he put seven rounds of 5.56 ammunition into one of these things. And it still got up and ran away. I'm not a gun expert, but my understanding is that that's a lot of of bullet <laughs> for a living yeah. a living entity to absorb and then continue to move into function. And he says they do bleed, they do respond to gunfire, but they don't just go down like you would anticipate. They they get up and they keep moving. Has he ever considered if he's had a chance to shoot more than one, has he ever considered going out and looking for the blood to get a swab, a, a slide? That is another excellent question and he has not managed to do so. That's an conversation we haven't had yet and admittedly i haven't spoken to him in several months um and it was since the book was written that a couple people asked me well what about the blood my god you're right what about the blood <laughs> so the to be continued i suppose is the answer there right and then it's trying to find somebody that's going to test the blood but if it is truly canine in nature or at least partly if the blood shows any triggers or trace of canine it'd probably be just quickly dismissed as oh it's probably a wolf or a a do, you know, large dog. It's exactly what I was, what I was going to say next is that if same with these bones, or if we did find a body or a skull, how would we know that this is something that we would define as paranormal or, you know, cryptozoological when, well, we if it's a giant skull with a big muzzle and fangs and biting looking, enough. I mean, that's a good sign, right? Fair, fair enough. Fair it's enough. not just like that was a bald white guy from Minnesota. That would be easy to figure out but you know when you look at the bones if it's you know jackal like and monstrous there's a pretty good sign that's probably not real natural or uh, uh something that we have yet to classify absolutely yeah yeah and and not having strong enough genetic knowledge I, I don't know what a blood sample from one of these things might show what would we be looking for in terms of variation from known canine breeds I don't know. My wife is a vet tech. She might be able to tell you more, but <laughs> personally, I'm not. Yeah. Well, what the hell are you doing on the show? Put her. I don't on. know. Where is yeah. Sarah? I got to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> tell people about your podcast. You do a podcast with your wife. Let them know about it. Let them know how they can find you and listen. Sure. Uh, our show is called Hey Strangeness. It was actually the first project I took on in this community and it led to everything else I'm doing now. So that's, you know, my, that's my baby, but, uh, we are coming back for season two very, very soon. It, uh, our first season, we focus primarily on folklore and t legend specific to Texas. Cause again, they're easy for us to research and we're kind of, kind of continuing that trend with season two. You can find us on Instagram, uh, at Hey underscore strangeness. And we're on all the major streaming platforms. Um, uh, Hey strangeness.com. You can find everything there as well. And then the book, of course, is being published by Small Town Monsters, uh, as well as the film, The Dogman Triangle, Werewolves in the Lone Star State. So definitely, definitely follow Small Town Monsters for updates. Now, with Small Town Monsters, uh, the documentary, the film they're doing, are they bringing you back out into the field to try to engage these things for the for the companion documentary yeah so we went out and we filmed in october of last year and it was primarily witness interviews we did visit a few locations such as plum creek uh dallas fort worth area we went out to canyon lake where sightings of these things have occurred but it's primarily focused on witness interviews 
I have a pipe dream of doing a follow up where we actually go out and, you know, the, the triangle part two or something like that, <laughs> where we actually go out and look for one of these things. But as far as I'm aware, there are no immediate plans. I'll have my wife whip you up a dog bone collar so that you've got milk bones around your neck to help bring the scent in. If that would help, Aaron, I'm, I'm if anything, I'm helpful in this field and I want to do what I can to help you have a better experience. That's what we need, man. We need everybody on board with this. <laughs> Get everybody working on this dog man thing because there's that's th right. There's a lot we haven't figured out yet. If my if my uneducated self, <laughs> as much education as I have, I'm not a professor or a zoologist. I'm a guy. If I was able to find this much, there has to be so much more. So let's let's the find Texas it. Dog Man Triangle. That's the name of the book. Link is on tonight's program guide. Hey, Strangeness, the name of their podcast and season two coming up soon. So go check it out wherever you listen to your podcast. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on and spending some time with us tonight. Thank you, Dave. I've been looking forward to it. I truly appreciate it. Do you have a wear cat? I think I hear. I do. I'm sorry. There's this, this street cat that comes in my backyard whenever I'm trying to record, I guess, because it hears me talking. So I apologize uh -huh. for that. No, I, that's, I'm glad it's yours for the first time. Usually it's mine walking around <laughs> stone to the balls on catnip, freaking out, man. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm glad it's your one. cat. Not at all. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thank you. All right. Uh, we got some more creepy creatures and I'm talking creepy, some weird stuff. Nikki Folsom's coming on to share some of those stories with us. Give us some insights into the strange and unusual and that's in Texas. Now you'll know why I leave my three correspondents in the Lone Star State and I stay here where it's safe in the North Star State. We don't have werewolves stalking us. At least I don't think so. And we certainly don't have these other creepy ass creatures. Stay tuned. More coming your way right here on the very best in Paranormal Talk Radio. I'm Dave Schrader and this is the Paranormal 60. Are you looking to purchase a new home but not sure where to start? That's completely normal because there's thousands of questions that need answers when it comes to a new home purchase. Like how much do I need to put down? What are the rates? What are the closing costs? What does my credit score need to be? That's where I come in. My name is Wendy Schrader and I'm a mortgage banker here at Paramount Residential Mortgage Group, also known as PRMG. And I'd be happy to answer any of those questions and help walk you through the mortgage process because buying a home is a stressful yet exciting time and I can make it easy for you if you mortgage with me at PRMG. My number is 763-203-9641 or you can email me at wschrader at prmg.net. I'd be happy to work with you and answer any questions you have and just get you to that closing table so that way you can turn that key and walk into your new home. Thank you so much. Haunted Magazine is a publication dedicated to all things paranormal and spooky. Each issue features articles, interviews, and stories about ghosts, hauntings, and other unexplained phenomena. The magazine also covers topics such as cryptozoology, UFOs, and other aspects of the supernatural. Expect to find in-depth investigations of haunted locations, first-hand accounts of ghostly encounters, and reports of paranormal events and attractions. The magazine also includes features on the latest ghost hunting technology and techniques, as well as tips for those looking to search the supernatural on their own. Issue 37, The Frights of Spring, will be in stores from March 6. So remember, don't be normal. Be paranormal, and order your copy, today. Hey everybody, welcome back to the program. This weekend, there are still some VIP passes available for Parasycon with the special guests at the Ohio State Reformatory in Mansfield. Make sure you check that out. Come on out, you'll meet me. You'll meet Shane Pittman from the Holzer Files and 28 Days Haunted. Aaron Sagers from 28 Days Haunted. Mike Ricksecker will be on hand. So will Marianne Winkowski, the real life ghost whisperer, the Ghost Brothers. Andrea Perrin, the surviving daughter from The Conjuring, the real story of The Conjuring. Uh, so many other great guests are going to be on hand all weekend along. Ghost hunts, parties. It's going to be a great time. I hope that you'll check it out. And coming up this June 15th through the 17th, 
Bill Chapel, me, Dave Schrader, Shane Pittman. We're going to be back for the spirits of summer, the Palmer House weekend. Come on out to Sock Center, Minnesota, and investigate one of the most haunted hotels in the world. <laughs> It's hard to do that at my age. So come on out, get out and investigate with these two knuckleheads from the Holzer Files. And for those of you that are fans of the Holzer Files, fans of mine, fans of Shane's, and you want a picture, an autograph from both of us, this picture, for those of you watching your screen, is available right now. All you have to do is email me, dave at paranormal60.com, and we can get the picture out to you. Autographed by both of us, $30 in hand. That's about a $10 savings. Usually it's $20 for me, $20 from Shane, $30 for this one picture with both of our signatures on it from the Holzer Files. Uh, I hope that you're interested in it. It is $7.95 shipping and handling. Email me, Dave, at paranormal60.com. Those will begin shipping next week. All right. Now that we've got all of that out of the way, ladies and gentlemen, let's get freaky with a Folsom. That's right. <laughs> Nikki Folsom is back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> yes. I have to warn Nikki off, off uh, screen, no cursing. Cause if you, if you caught like our way old episode, I think of Jericho cruise or the walking dead cruise yeah. or something, she was one of my guests and it's, she is a potty mouth. Just I am. Filth monger. <laughs> Uh, well, the crews are feeding me alcohol. What do you, what do you expect? Oh, yeah. Oh, they are feeding me alcohol. <laughs> Let's blame it on the good good people okay. aboard the Norwegian right. cruises. Yeah, there you go. Chachi, chachi, chachi. Conf conflicted reality. Look, words are hard. I said, conf yeah. I almost blew the name of it. Conflicted <laughs> reality, my paranormal journey. That's the book by Nikki Folsom with a foreword by Dave Schroeder. Yeah. So uh, if you are interested in getting a copy of that book, do you still have ones that are signed by both of us? No, I believe we sold them all, but I'm going to send you some so that you can sign them when we have more. <laughs> you know what? Chachi's coming to visit in June. Just send oh, them yeah. with a bunch of books. Yeah, that's, that's what idea. I'm saying. Yeah, definitely a good idea. Oh. So I tasked, I tasked the lovely Nikki Folsom with telling me about some more of the creepy creatures from her state because... Uh, Listen, I dig around. I know Minnesota's got some weird stuff. You've heard my wife's voice. We've got weird stuff in Minnesota. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you just want to oh, turn yeah. that key and buy your house, got to kink it on this <laughs> stool. All of a sudden, it's like just watching you. I feel like I'm back on the ship again, Nikki. I can't, can't get comfortable up here. Um, so we've got a lot of weird stuff to talk about tonight. But I want to start with a more personal tale. Yeah. This one comes from your lovely daughter, Ashton. So yeah. talk to us a little bit about the encounter she had. Well, what's interesting about the encounter is she didn't tell me about it for years. And mm. I'm like, of all people, me, you didn't tell me and come to find out the person she had the encounter with, they didn't even talk about it for years. So this was, she was in about eighth grade. Now she's graduated mm. college at this point. Um, but so this was about 2013, 2014. And her school every year, what they would do is they'd get the, the class of the kids and they would go away to a camp, which is called HEB camp. HEB is one of our grocery stores here in Texas. It's fabulous. Love our HEBs. Anyway, they have a camp out. Wait, so you have a, you have a camp run by a grocery store, not yep. Bucky's. Bucky's, not Bucky's seems like the right people to run a camp, but no, <laughs> you'd right. think HEB camp. All right. So -E she's going to go, she's going to go make friendship bracelets, learn how to bag groceries. Yeah. For the whole thing. <laughs> Well, okay. she's going to go out in nature because it's 1,900 acres um, in, I think it's Leakey, Texas or Lakey, Texas. Um, I, I can't pronounce it, so just just go with me on this. But, but uh -huh. it's out there. It's near the Frio River. And she was telling me the story of her and one of her friends had walked away from the camp one day. And they were just kind of walking down one of the, the like little streams off of the, of the river. And as she was walking... She she and her friend both noticed a wall in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of, of trees, a wall. And I said, well, what did the wall look like? She said, uh, it looked like a bedroom wall, like you would like the normal size of a bedroom wall, but taller, just much, much taller. And I was like, OK. And she said, so we thought it was like the back of a storage building or something. So we, did, we weren't too freaked out because, OK, it's possible there could be a, a, a building maybe. But as they got closer, they realized it was just a wall, just a wall standing up middle of nowhere. Um, it was made of limestone and on it, 
it had a giant circle with an X through it. So they took off running and went back to the camp. And I said, what made you start running? And she said, well, I had heard of Slender Man. And I had heard that some of the things that I was seeing kind of aligned to that. And she said, but I thought it was just made up and it wasn't possible. I thought somebody was playing a joke on me. Cool. So later that evening, they went out to do, uh, they went down the river. They went over the little like stepping stones of the river to go to the little activities area that set up for the camp. And, you know, to get there, you have to go through the woods and all this good stuff. Well, her and her friend got bored and decided to head back about, I think it was about 1030, she said. And to get back, they had to step over the stepping stones, go through mm -hmm. the go through the trees. And she said, and, and as they were going through the trees, there were like 30 to 40 feet of trees. And on the other side of the tree, she could see this gravel road. And as they got out of the trees, they could see on the other side of the gravel road, another set of trees was something they had to walk through. And as they got closer, it went pitch black. And she said, like somebody had just poured black ink all over everything. And then she said, out of it, a shadow appeared that was darker than that. And it was like inhumanly tall. And the the arms were horribly long. She said, they just, they, I knew it, what, there was nothing right about it. So all the limbs were just really, really weird. Uh, she didn't, she nor her friend both saw it. Neither one said anything to other, each other. They just took off running, running so fast back to the river, onto the stepping stones, taken off down the stepping stones. They ran into a teacher, almost knocked her over. <laughs> and they got back to the camp. Uh, the teacher talked, took them back to the camp, took them back to their cabin. And neither her nor her friends spoke about this for years until I believe I was writing conflicted reality when she said, Hey, I think I have a, an experience I should share with you. Like, I cannot believe you haven't shared this up until now. She's like, it was really disturbing. And so yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of crazy that, that, that your own child is experiencing this stuff and <laughs> she didn't say right. a word. But, yeah. Well, Right. And, and it's funny that it's taken her this long. She's been on a bunch of our foreign tours and adventures. She's been yeah. to conferences. Uh, she's got Chachi as a dad. You would think by now nothing would be weird or affect her the same way. Well, and that's what's funny is her whole life, she's seen things just like me. She's seen shadow people. She's seen apparitions. She's seen all mm -hmm. kinds of things. As she hears it, um, she senses it. And for her not to say something, was really strange. And I wonder if it's just because it was something so different than what she usually sees, or she may have been conflicted in her brain going, this is supposed to be make believe. This isn't supposed to be a real thing. <laughs> so. All right. Well, that's a, that's a weird one, especially when it's with your daughter, but she, right. that never kept her from going back out in the woods or back to grocery yeah. camp. Um, did, I'm trying to remember if she went back. I guess she did go back to the camp later in the, later in the uh like in her high school year she went back but i'm pretty sure she didn't go out in the woods by herself mm. <laughs> she had pretty kate with idea. her <laughs> well as we continue to talk about strange creatures on your list there was the houston batman yes now which... i found the slender man image i found images for all of these different creatures i couldn't believe it when i found the houston batman it's chilling <laughs> absolutely <laughs> terrifying he's a very pretty Batman. Though. Yes, yes. So <laughs> what is the, I love that little girl in the back's looking at him like, what am I watching? This is uh, interesting. So what, uh, what is the Houston Batman? So the Houston Batman, there's only been a handful of encounters with the mm -hmm. Houston Batman. Um, it's supposed to be a, a creature, man-like creature that's seven-ish feet tall, six and a half to seven feet tall with a 15 foot wingspan of, of bat wings. And the, the original story is from June of 1953. And there were three neighbors sitting out on the, their porch. It was 2.30 in the morning. And they saw this creature emerge from the woods. And he had bat wings. And before you look at me like that, I see you look. Um, there's there's all say, you guys, you guys are allowed to drink and drive. And we are. <laughs> we so, are. I got a question if there was any imbibing going on at this point. <laughs> It could have been. Well, one of the neighbors was, I believe she was 11 or 14. So she definitely was not. Well, it's Texas. They might have been. Well, come on. Yeah. <laughs> she might have been. Um, yeah. But it, it's it's fascinating to me because it 
it, there's only been a handful of sightings. One of them was actually in San Antonio in 2009 mm -hmm. uh, near the airport, which, uh, but the family that saw it will no longer speak. They won't do interviews. I believe it's Ken Gerhard that was the one that wrote about it and said that unfortunately they won't talk to anyone. But um, so I don't know if maybe they found out, okay, it was a hoax and somebody was messing with us, or they didn't want to look crazy because we all know what happened to the Lutz family and we don't, you know, you get bullied. People are crazy, yeah. but, but yeah, that's, there's a, it's the Houston Batman because he originated in Houston and he has bat wings. He just keeps <laughs> migrating. Wow. Yeah. It, 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 have they seen him feed on like cattle or no? Not that I, not that I've read. No, that could he's just up there fighting crime, y'all. He's up there, he's up there fighting crime. I, I don't know what he does. I don't know if he's out there just um hmm. he's just an undiscovered species that's just out there and somebody just happened to see him. If he's an alien, if who knows? Maybe, maybe it's just some maybe Chachi decided to get dressed up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> I would not either, not at all. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the Lake Worth monster. Now, this is kind of Texas throwing their hat in the Bigfoot ring, right? It, it is, it is. And I had to write it down because there's so, you're going to see me look at notes because there are so many different sightings. I actually mm -hmm. was shocked because, you know me, I'm normally, I'm looking into shadow people or or um, ghosts or fairies or things like that. So when I started looking into, looking into Bigfoot, Words I was hard, shocked. Huh? Words is hard. Yeah. Here, yeah, got it from Eric. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so the Lake Worth monster is what it's the Lake Worth near Fort Worth, Texas. And he's about seven to eight feet tall, weighs about 300 pounds. And he's covered with white or brown hair, different reports. Um, <laughs> it's it's yeah. either white or brown, one or the other. Definitely. Yeah. There's two different, there's multiple reports. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't even, mm -hmm. I can't even cover all the reports in the time. Depends on how many beers they've been drinking to be right. more specific. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> but you. one common denominator with the sighting of the Lake Worth monster is it's, he's near water, which, mm. you know, it makes a lot of sense. Sure. Uh, the, the first one that, that, um, that I was able to capture, at least, you know, in my research of it, um, which would, probably could have Aaron come back on and give us some more information on this. But summer of 1989, the sightings of this guy were reported in the Greer Island area of Lake Worth, which is again, Fort Worth. And it continues like every year, local witnesses, 19, uh, 1969, local witnesses saw the beast become annoyed and hurl a car, car wheel and tire at them from 500 feet away. And then in November of 1969, Charles Buchanan was sleeping in a, the open bed of his pickup truck and he was yeah, awakened. He was. <laughs> yeah, right? He was right. awakened when he was grabbed by the creature and pulled from the truck. Then the creature stuffed his bag, stuffed a bag of chicken in his mouth and then <laughs> shuffled off into the water. <laughs> So now that sounds like Chachi to me. He eats chicken. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. that does sound like Chachi. But yeah, there's there's countless experiences with this. I had I had no idea. Now, what I will say is I go to Jefferson, Texas twice a year. And mm -hmm. it's the Bigfoot capital of the world. And and that's where Blind Dog is. He's up there in Marshall. And there are a lot of accounts of of Bigfoot sightings up there, which is which is fascinating to me. All described the same. All mm -hmm. of them. But some of them, they throw rocks at you. You throw rocks at them. Some of them, one of them, Jeez. a guy was shooting at him. I'm like, oh. yeah, one of them, um, they were, the, there were two hunters out there and mm -hmm. in, in the woods with him. And they sh were shooting at him and they, the Bigfoot chased him or the Lake Worth monster chased them back to their cabin. And <laughs> when they went inside, he started tearing things up. And the next morning, a pig was missing. So I was like, yeah, you don't mess with the Lakewood monster. We know he needs his bacon and chicken <laughs> and a schlitz, his what, schlitz. What's, the, what's the big texas beer i don't know what it is um shiner i would say shiner shiner, yeah. shiner bach shiner yeah yes. all right now i can understand yes. no wonder he's hungry for chicken who's yes. not <laughs> okay yes. uh that's that's weird so we've got we've talked about a slender man encounter your daughter had mm -hmm. we talked about the houston Batman. Uh, giant bat which a lot of people in chat were talking about is it's almost like uh texas's version of mothman i, I was just gonna say that absolutely were you really just gonna say i was that? gonna say the mothman because yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> you saw the people in chat say it or because i can't see the kidding. chat so <laughs> oh likely story unlike your husband who ignores the news and just reads the chat the whole time and then when i throw it to him he goes oh it's my turn <laughs> 
<laughs> He's probably rewatching the chat right now. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Why is your trader putting that one up? You should put that comment up. Where's Chachi? <laughs> Hashtag where's Chachi? <laughs> All right. So now this one, I can never say the name properly. I've butchered it for the better part of a decade. La Yolola. La la la. <laughs> My Sharona. It's Am I right? La Yorona. That's what I said. Yeah. La Yorona. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, she is. Um... Now, this isn't a cryptozoological creature, but this is definitely something well, dark and mysterious. Yes, because there's a couple. So, um, La Yorona has multiple theories. Show off. And what? Mm -hmm. I live in Texas. I live in San Antonio. La Yorona. Um, um, mm -hmm. It, it, they have multiple theories on on where she came from, the origins okay. of this story. And it basically, um, uh, La Llorona is Spanish for the weeping woman in English. So it, it translates. Actually, according to my translate dictionary, La Llorona is Spanish for hard to say. Oh, you know, <laughs> to, to some people, it depends on where you look. Say it again. Why? Can, I cannot. My tongue refuses to say it, the second word. La Llorona. It's uh, la ya ro na, but roll your R. La ya rona. Yep, there you go. La ya rona. Look hey, 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 la ya rona. <laughs> All right. All right. Yes. Very exciting. I'm uh, learning. So, what's interesting about her is mm -hmm. that she's most commonly found in South Texas. Uh, you have a perfect picture of her because she's got long Thank dark you. hair, white a white dress, and she's very she's very sad. Um, what often happens with her is when she's seen or heard, she always always comes with death or disease or something bad that's that's associated with her. Um, oftentimes, people see her or hear her before they see her. If they ever see her, um, they'll hear crying softly, and then it'll get louder and louder and louder. Uh, one of my friends, if if you read my first book, The Haunted Harlequin, Robert um, Robert and Sean are two of my dearest friends and Robert actually grew up in El Paso. And when he was in the backyard of his grandmother's house one time, when he was, as, when they were growing up, he heard her. He, he cause it, I was shocked. I had no idea. I knew the legend. I just didn't know anybody that actually heard her. Um, that's right, Donna. Um, <laughs> yeah, Donna, so, Donna from the chat says, uh, La Yarona is the South American version of the Irish Banshee. And it sure does seem to follow that same kind of thing. You can, most people hear the Banshee scream and that means somebody you know is going to die. Mm -hmm. If if you see the Banshee, it means you're going to die. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Well, and and the other one that if, if we have time, we'll talk about is Le, La Lechusa. And oh, we're going to talk about it. Okay, good. I've she's, got images. Yeah. She's very similar too. Mm -hmm. um, the, like I said, there's hundreds of versions of this, but basically the most common legend is a, a young girl named Luisa, who was a peasant who started dating um, a wealthy man named Don Muno. And Don, of course, had no intentions of marrying a peasant because she was not equal to him, um, but she had her eyes set on marriage. But what he could do is he could have her as a mistress. So he gave her a cottage on his land, gave her jewels and beautiful clothes and even children. Um, and she, he would come visit all the time with his kids. And then all of a sudden he stopped coming. So she worked up the nerve to go to the main house to find out where he was. And when she saw the servant, they told him today was his wedding day that he was getting married. And he did. He, he married a, a wealthy aristocratic woman. It wasn't her. She was crushed. And as she walked back to her house or to her cottage, her, her grief turned into anger and she was raging mad. So to get back at, the, at Don Muno, she drowned the children. And for the rest of her life, she was wailing, looking for her children. And then after death, that's what um, continued to happen. It, there's, there's, she, she, that's where you hear her. But there's other stories about her. You've, I don't know if you've ever heard the donkey lady in San Antonio with Donkey Lady Bridge. There's stories associated with La, with La Llorona who um, she actually has the, the donkey face because she was burned in one of the other versions. Um, she, her children burned in a fire and died and she lived and she was just dis, uh, disformed. And that's how she became the donkey lady. So mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting how they all kind of weave in and out of each other. 
Yeah, that is mm -hmm. very strange. Now, I asked you to bring creepy and weird. You've done pretty well so far. <laughs> I look up the image of, what do you call this thing? La Lechuza? La Lechuza. <laughs> All right, La Lechuza. <laughs> again, in Spanish, I'm pretty sure is my shoes. No, it actually means wrong. owl. <laughs> owl. It means owl, la lechuza. Or my shoes. Where are my shoes? Where are my shoes? Yeah. <laughs> so I did. And this was the first image. And this thing is terrifying. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So for those yeah. of you just listening, it is this humanish like face with these giant owl eyes that are white. And instead of a nose and mouth, it's got this broken up beak and it's shrill and shrieking. It seems to be almost in like a, a, a potato sack kind of looking you know, Grim Reaper outfit. Uh, mm -hmm. Freaky. Freaky as hell. Uh, at least that's what I thought in the beginning. But sh share a little bit about this story. Okay. She is from Mexican folklore. She's It's very popular lore in Texas and in mm -hmm. Mexico. She's a shape-shifting witch owl owl um she's roughly seven i know i can i can say spanish she's one of them there witch arrows <laughs> um she's about seven to eight feet tall she has a huge wingspan and she has the face of either a bird um or an old woman with a bird matched together like you saw with what mm -hmm. you just showed dave but some say that it's an owl some say it's an eagle so depending on which lore you follow um mm -hmm. she does resemble the harpy of greek mythology who was like the um for Zeus, it was like the hounds of Zeus who would go collect people and bring bodies back to Zeus. This is right. what she, this is what she did. Um, she also has traits of the siren, which is half bird, half women, or half woman, um, who lures people in with sounds, and the banshee. So there's is really what, what we were just talking about earlier. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, one of the things I found interesting about her is that she has the power to control the weather, which is very similar to Actually, it's not similar. It's exactly what fairies can do. And the banshee is a fae, hence the banshee, <laughs> the she. Anyway, that's a whole different subject. Um, so she was once a, a curandera, which is um, a witch that practices good magic, like white magic. Um, but legend said she traded her her soul to Satan for magical abilities and shape-shifting powers. So when the townspeople found out that she was doing dark magic, so in Spanish, a witch is a bruja. So when they found out she was a dark magic bruja, they killed her. So she returned to seek revenge on those who murdered her. So that's why she, she roams. And every night she's out and looking for people to eat, looking for her prey. Yeah. Now, do people, I mean, obviously it's folklore. It sounds like those kind of stories you tell kids to keep them from going to the water's edge or into the woods alone. But are there people that legitimately witness this? I know with La Llorona, God, it's getting better. Look yeah. at you. I'm so La proud of you. Uh, it, it's, that being has such a deep roots in a culture that it, it and people seem to see and hear this thing often or more often than they should what about la chusa la chusa she's had experiences That's what as i well. said <laughs> i know they they have experiences with her as well including in 1975 in Ro robstown the police actually saw her and filed a report on seeing her so sting and stuart copeland saw <laughs> greg lawson <laughs> no oh that police mm. <laughs> i'm just kidding um but no no they they do have there was a gentleman um that they recorded an account from him. He was 10 years old when he saw her and uh, he saw her as the, as the owl with a ginormous wingspan. And his grandmother actually came running outside and told him to get inside before she like locked in on him as prey. So she did, he didn't, wasn't taken right, away. There, there is like, there is some giant barn owl, right? That stands like two or three feet tall with like a, a massive wingspan. I, I, now you're talking about animals. I don't know. I think so. <laughs> Dave, God. let's keep it to the fae. Can let's we keep stick it to, to the, the fae, fae and, the and Mothman, okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I do believe there, but but we have owls. Like we have an owl that sits on top of our our um chimney. You know where our chim our chimney is because you? you can hear him. Because Who most alien encounters, people see owls. Are you sure you're just not being probed at night? <laughs> 
I shouldn't give Chachi ideas. I'll be like, <laughs> Nikki, it's the owl, I swear. I think I hear him in the other room laughing. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I actually wondered where my Hogwarts letter was because I could hear the owl hooting, hooting at the top of the chimney. But yeah, he sits up there. He's, he's very pretty. He's not two to three feet tall. He might be two feet. He's not three feet tall. Yeah. It better not be a Lechusa. Depends on if he's wearing lifts. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so, you know, I was looking, I'm reading these stories. They were really kind of chilling, these people that have seen this thing, encountered it. Some some of the images of her almost make her look kindly. Like her punishment was kind of being this half animal, half human being. But it's interesting that people always consider owls wise, right? So that would be kind of a visage you would take if you were going to be that, you know, that being. So it's weird. Although... Kind of the fear factor was pulled away from me when I found this little gem. Oh, no. It's La Lechusa, the owl. The owl's warning us to be quiet so we don't wake up El Mago. We'll sing the song really softly. And when we sing... <laughs> yeah, and then she goes on to sing, La La Chusa, La La Chusa. <laughs> what the hell, Dora the Explorer? <laughs> Stop well, appropriating the French songs right? and turning them into a creepy witchy owl thing. Why is Dora talking about la la shoes or is she? Oh, saying, it's an owl. It's la lechusa, the owl. <laughs> All right, I heard you the first time, Dora. Relax. <laughs> well, She's some so people say uppity. some people say that. Um, so, to, not to get too far into the banshee, but some people say that la lechusa is also. Um, doesn't cause harm unless somebody actually caused their they go after people that caused harm they don't go after people that didn't just like the banshee and i actually learned um recently that the banshee that some another belief of the banshee from those in ireland is that she is a witch actually and she mm. is sent to families as a curse sometimes and sometimes she's ancest ancestral and she'll just stay with them um so it's it's really interesting that uh La Chusa is very similar to the Banshee and La Llorona is very similar, has very similar traits. So you know how I always say, what if it's all the same stuff? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, it, it's just the different iterations from different countries. These things just, you know, there's slight differences in all of these different creatures. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. Very cool. Well, Nikki, thanks for coming on tonight, spending a little time with us. Again, Nikki's book, Conflicted Reality, My Paranormal Journey, with a foreword by yours truly, good old <laughs> Darkness Dave, uh, is out and available. We have a link for it on today's program guide so you can get it. Or if you see us at one of the conferences coming up, like Michigan Paracon, I think uh, I'll even have them on my table in Austin at GalaxyCon. We'll have them available there, signed by both of us, so you can get that uh, if you're interested. So, Nikki, as always, thanks for coming on and spending some time. Thanks for having, having me. This is great. Yeah, good talking to you, and we will talk to you again soon. Chachi, of course, will be here on Wednesday with the Colonel and the Paranormal Detective himself. I want to just wrap up the show as I began the show, and let's keep our little friend Chevy in Butte, Montana, and her father Jason in our thoughts and prayers with what they're going through. Give them both strength, fortify them with love, positivity, energy, as little Chevy is the backbone for this family and helping her father as he deals and navigates with this illness. We know we can get through it and let's just send him all the positive vibes, prayers, good thoughts, and energy we possibly can, because that's what we do here on the Paranormal 60. We're a community. We're a family. La familia. I think that's Spanish or Italian. Very close. I can't tell you. I can say it's not La Chusa. That is my shoes on the owl, I believe. Uh, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time here with me. And may the darkness of our world be just a little lighter with the information that we share. And I hope that I'll see you guys, as many of you as possible, this weekend at Mansfield Reformatory in Mansfield, Ohio. Tickets are still on sale. Go to darknessevents.com, find out about it there, and all the other great events I will be a part of. And I do hope I get a chance to see you. Remember, selfies and hugs are always free. <laughs>
werewolves and dogmen. Dogmen and werewolves. Where are the stories of the Snallygaster? I'm offended.